this was the original. Isn't it? He just like glitches while he's playing. He's, like, he scratches it. Yeah. Yeah, they haven't done any hologram concerts with like classical composers, but I think it's just a matter of time. Bring in the strings. In Japan, they have. <laughs> There's a Japanese pop star that's just hologram Mozart. Okay, we'll fade it out there. That's a nice, nice opening. Uh, hello and welcome to Question Block. Hi! I'm, I'm uh, DJ Wires, also known as Alex. You can find me Instagram, Wires of NYC. And joining me is my co host, Aerialist. Find me at Aerialist. <laughs> or hanging from, from your ceiling. This is Secret Loft's live Instagram podcast, and today we're talking about the history of music. Talking about music. Just saying hi to shout out the Brooklyn Bush. Uh, hi! Thank you for your support on Twitch. Uh, he is a musician himself, so maybe we'll, we'll talk with him a little bit later. Um, but yeah, we're going to we're gonna be talking about a lot of classical musicians. Obviously, the history of music is a huge category. There are entire podcasts devoted to just single periods of like classical music or just single genres of music. But those people aren't overly ambitious like <laughs> we are. So they we're cram all of it. Yeah, they didn't work as hard as we did. So we're gonna yeah. we're gonna give you it all. And uh, yeah, like a I guess like caveat. I don't know up front is that like no caveats. We, we didn't. Uh, this we is going to be primarily the Western tradition, uh, or what is known as like Western classical Ooh, music. I got the history of other oh, cultures too. Don't worry. That. There's no caveats. This is going to be perfect. Okay, cultural ethnographer aerialist is going to yeah. fill it in then. I'm I, I'm just doing this uh, so that I don't have to sing because I can't sing, and I and uh, you're the real mu you're the true beauty of of music. When I am a musician. I'll be demonstrating some musical technique uh, on guitar. Um, can I give you a, a fun factoid about guitar to yeah. kick things off? So they don't know when the like first guitars were invented, but it's from the Spanish guitarra, which so <laughs> somewhere in medieval Spain is when like Sweet. the modern guitar took for, like shape. But before that, you can trace it back to Arab Arabic, the word guitarra, and then like Greek before that. And so they even there's some Babylonian tablets with people playing what looks like a guitar, and in the Bible. In the Old Testament, the word kitara is mentioned four times, and like angels are playing them. And the English translation in the King James Bible just translated it as harp, because that's boring. But probably the angels were playing guitar. That's so cool. So the angels in the Bible, when they showed up to like lead the wise men to Jesus, they were just like John Mayer, like strumming yeah. some guitar, playing some cool. They played a lot of. Uh... The, yeah, they had a full band of angels. <laughs> yeah, they had a, their own symphony. We are the biblical angels. <laughs> I think they were just trying to like, come on, shepherds, let's go see this baby Jesus. And they're, they're like, I'm a baby <laughs> it just too. Was, it just was, yeah, Christian rock music just like 2,000 years ago. Yeah. Um, all right, that was my fact on guitar. I'm going to turn it over to you for the, the classical rundown, and I'm going to DJ the composers as you talk about them. Okay, great. All right, so starting in the Stone Age... <laughs> They had music back then. They think up until, let's see, up until like medieval times, they weren't sh people, they, I don't, music scientists aren't sure how music sounded up until like the medieval times. But in the Stone Age, they think they had, uh, they had bone flutes and drums. Then in the Bronze Age, there was like bronze instruments, like cymbals, and they also had horns, like bronze horns and stuff like that. And probably like animal horns too. And con conch, the conch, they play yeah. the conch. Nice. Playing the conch out, then. Yeah. 
Lord of the Flies. Yeah. Mesopotamia, the, there was the invention of the harp and the oldest written record of music because the Mesopotamians had all the scribes. Did they have musical notation? How Did they write down any of their songs? No, there was just like someone's diary and they were like, uh, today some dude played music and it, it sucked or whatever. I got tickets to the hottest Mesopotamia concert. Okay. Right. And then uh, in Egypt, they also had music. <laughs> I wrote that. I actually wrote that down. What were they? Panpipes? Was it reeds? They play like reeds. They'll blow through the reeds. Like, woo, woo, yeah. Kind of yeah. Because they had rivers, so probably. Everything reeds. was along the Nile. Yeah. yeah. The original guitars used cat guts. Yeah. So, the, so Egypt probably. So maybe. Yeah, maybe they, had, they had those too. They had a lot of cats around. Yeah. They're like, we'll take the guts from when we mummify the cat. Mm-hmm. Uh, okay, so then... So is this good music? We don't really know. We don't know. We don't know what it sounds like. The hieroglyphics, guy giving the thumbs up. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The, in China, there was an imperial music bureau. Nice. Yeah, so the, their government was hella controlling even even in the 7th century BC. <laughs> Were they, was, do you know, was music just kind of recreational, like a cool no. thing to listen to, or it was like... No, it wasn't. It was... Have, it was religious? It, well, because if you played good music, like good, like harmony and pitch, um, there were harmony and pitch, like rules, the government controlled, like the rules about that. Right. Um, they were, it was based on Confucian philosophy, so they said like good music creates peace, and uh, like unharmonious music creates destruction and i think we feel that way today even. yeah <laughs> yep um people hating on punk rock and and, and there dubstep. were yeah there was there were music of the courts and then there was like uh non-imperial music which was trash i like how there's court music so they had folk yeah. music too more or less right that would be the term for it the music yeah. of the people uh yes and then they actually valued. They, there's uh, many blind musicians that we're going to talk about, blind and deaf. They were like losing their sense, or not deaf, I guess blind. Yeah, deaf. hopefully they can hear. Just um, Beethoven. Beethoven's our one deaf composer. Right, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, Shi Kong was a blind musician of the courts, a famous uh, like Chinese one. They really valued him. They were like, it's even more impressive. He was like, <laughs> the, he was the Chinese Stevie Wonder, I guess. Uh, nice. Yeah. Okay, so then, uh, you know, in, in Greece. Oh, before we jump into Pythagoras and like starting to formalize music, who are you dressed as? Oh, I feel like Mozart, because didn't he have white hair? I mean, they all wore wigs. I think he was wearing wigs when he performed. Really? Like, I like Beethoven right? the best. So. He had crazy hair. Right? Yeah, this is. So I feel like I'm more Mozart. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yeah. I don't. I don't like. <laughs> Mozart. We'll get into the timeline later, but Mozart precedes Beethoven by like two generations, by the way. Yeah, I know. I know so. that. Yeah, yeah. I'm I just don't telling like our, our listeners because everybody assumes that I'm all the going, composers live at the same time. I got a timeline. I did so much okay. research. Well, not to jump ahead. It's just saying that's who you're dressed as. Oh my as. lord! I'm okay. dressed like a rock star because I'm. You're dressed as, as Franz Liszt. I'm Franz Liszt. Yeah. The the rock star composer, uh, featured in the band Phoenix's song Listomania. It's, it's about his. Uh, he was super popular and a virtuoso pianist. He was a pe he was a, he had a virtuous penis. He did. Uh, okay, so in Greece, right? They uh, <laughs> this is so funny. So they had the lyre. They played the lyre a lot. Um, it's like a harp, I guess. They talked about it a lot. The, um, there's a lot of stories. So lyre was a teaching instrument. It has four strings. The, yeah, the Greeks there's had, Orpheus, right? Orpheus and his hot wife who dies. So the the, the professionals the in Greece played the kitara. Oh, okay. Which was a guitar-like harp, though, that you held out. But Apollo is shown as playing, he's playing a guitar. He's playing a professional version. The lyre is like child, the child's educational tool. Yeah, but it's the one that Orpheus played. You know, he like took his, his lyre down to Hades and he was like, give me my hot oh, wife true. back. Right, so they, they talked about that. 
they invented like tragedy the greek tragedy which was kind of like a musical but there wasn't any dancing and because there was like a lot of gay people in um ancient greece and there you know you couldn't dance to this like liar music it really sucked for them <laughs> it was a really sad existence so you couldn't dance and there were no gays composing the music so Lady Gaga couldn't exist at that right. point. So in their history. best gay is they went around searching for something that you could dance to. Basically, they're like, "Where's the, where's the goddamn rhythm?" Oh, um, I wanted to chime in as we before we get too far forward into modernity. The there's a theory that human speech developed alongside music, like during like Neanderthal times, like a million or so years ago, and so the sound that you can make, like playing rocks and stones or whatever, there's like three tones you can do. So there's like rings uh, and there's like hits, like percussive sounds. Um, and then there's sort of scrapes or whatever. As you sort of drag a stick on something. What moron came up with this theory? This so I, sounds like a, a failed paleontologist. Pr probably like dozens of PhDs in various <laughs> academic departments. Okay. It's quite possible this is to it's total bullshit and they're just guessing right. But there's a theory that like, well, maybe if we see the things that you can actually make noise with as instruments, if you're like a Stone Age person, maybe language sounds were imitating that. To be so honest, they're like, I th they think that like the sounds in these like very, you know, proto human languages were like based on the sounds you would hear in nature. Yeah, to be honest, I don't think that cave people really were doing, I think the, any music or whatever they had was like for hunting and whatnot. I, yeah, I think only agrarian societies like had recreational shit. So, oh, okay. That's my that's my theory. You know, as a as a paleontologist, as a musicologist, anthropologist. True. Early humans. Okay, continue. Sorry. Okay, so this is yeah. I don't know what any of these like musical terms mean, so you can define them. So they did Greeks invented the concept of a tetrachord. Mm. I, what is a tetrachord? So, I mean, tetra is the three. Pre no, right. Tr that's tri. Oh. Tetra is four. Four, okay. So it would be a four note chord. Which would be like what? So, would you like to hear an example? Yes. So, I brought a, I have brought a, a learning aid. I, my own Kitara. Your own liar, because it's the teaching. It's the teaching so tool. teaching. This is a six string. Ooh. Fancy. But, uh,. So an example of a tetrachord, and it's that's kind of like uniquely Greek. The, in the classical tradition, which we'll get into, most chords you just need, for the most basic chords, you need three notes. Yeah. So almost always uh, on guitar and also piano is you have the first, which is like your root note. So I'm going to play a C on this case. Okay. And then you play, you often have the third. And we'll talk about scales later. That informs if it's a major or minor, if it's a happy or a sad chord. Okay. So in the case of like the C. Um, Can you just play tetrachord? Yeah, I'll just give you a tetrachord. Just do a tetrachord. So an example of a tetrachord would be like a seventh, <laughs> generally, right? Just do a tetrachord. Tetrachord, do it. Okay. Thank you. Amazing. You they invented that concept. All right. I won't That's what we that. need. It's too much explaining because right. my head is about to explode. That was a major seventh. Yeah. My beautiful white haired head is about to like just spill out. Okay. Right, you're continue, sorry, wait, you're so much smarter than me. I'm just like, no, I can't. Um, yeah. He's a musician, like a true trained musician. I classically learned, I faked my way into being a drummer in my school band so that I would not have to learn music. And I couldn't play the drums either. But so. you're a dancer, so. Jokes Rhythm, on you. Rhythm is a dancer. Okay, so uh, Pythagoras, who was like a great, he had a cult, he loved triangles. Um, I do some maintenance on this guitar. He, uh, he was like, oh yeah, pitch and rhythm, kind of they come from the same place. Intervals are made using ratios. And he talked about like harmony of the spheres. So his cult was like super into... Uh, they were super into like the sounds that the planets would make <laughs> and the sounds that numbers and shapes would make. They were kind of like, uh, so they were having like kinesthesia happen, <laughs> I guess. 
synesthesia. So there, there is a, as Pythagoras noted this, but the entire Western tradition does use certain ratios in how, like, what sounds good. So, right. So everything you've heard is actually your brain doing a lot of math to make it, like, sound good when you That's, think a song is catchy. Yeah. So can I show you one real quick? Yeah. So guitar is, it is an example of what's called a chordophone. Okay, just Which means it. it has strings, right? Okay. So look, the length of the string, this is my, like, E string. That's right. a note. If I cut the length of the string in half, that goes up an octave. And the frequency of that string doubles. So, so the pitch... So basically, it sounds good when you do that. So the pitch sounds like the same note. So we'd say that's an E. This is an E an octave higher. Got it. Okay. So they're like the same. It's like the father and like the child. Not quite. It really is just stepping up the scale of... And in piano, it'd be like the piano repeats every 12 keys. Is a new okay, octave. that's a good way of putting it. Right. Yeah. And so one more is that the uh, fifth, it's called, which on my E string, the fifth is a B. That is a third. So this, if I hold here a third of the way down, the length of the string, that is a fifth. Right, because, and it's like the fifth thingy So here. if I play the, the, fifth, the, like... the two notes together, I get a power chord. Oh, I which see. Which is effectively the root, the fifth, and the octave. And that means they sound really, it sounds good. Or not. Generally, yeah. I mean, that's the basis of punk rock is all just power It just chords. sounds good. That's sounds what you're good. saying. Like, so if you play those two together, they sound good. Yeah. So the neat thing there is I just, when I play this chord, what I'm actually playing you is a pitch. I'm playing you a pitch generated with a third of that length string and a pitch generated with a half of that okay, length okay, string. Okay, okay, okay. Good. Okay. okay. I'm like, okay, good. I was, I got scared. I was like, it's going to get crazy again. Well, it's funny that it's, the very cool thing that comes out of music is that like, you're like, wait, why would, for some reason that sounds good to my brain. Why? It's a, like a mathematical relationship. It shouldn't matter. Maybe it doesn't, maybe it's just, it happens to work out with the math every time, but it actually isn't. It's just random. What? Okay. There's a lot of debate. Is it just because that's what you've heard all your life and what you're used to? Or is there some like order to it where your brain is actually figuring out these ratios and telling you that that's good? I think your brain figures out the ratios and mine does not. Okay. <laughs> All right, I'll let, you, okay. I'll let you continue with the history. That was your aside in music theory. I'll be uh, back. Where are you going? Are you going to change? No, no, I'm just putting that down. I oh, said okay. I'll, I'll be back with more music theory in 20 minutes. Okay. Continue. Oh, okay, that was great. You're such a good guitar player. Okay. So then there's, oh yeah, Cleonitis. <laughs> I'm just laughing because that sounds like a... Uh, like Cronitis. Cronitis, fluffy. fluffy. Yeah, Cleonitis. He was like talking about tones and semitones. He was like one of the Roman people. Okay. Um, you want to know about tones and semitones? No, because we have so much more to get through, and okay. there it's going to come up again. So I mean, I do, but I we've got okay. we've got a lot more. So okay, so the medieval this we can pull up a song of this. So the medieval church, there's like there's all these chants. There's like a lot of chanting. Um, and it's called... Just kind of just skip across the Roman Empire, I guess. Did they have music? I not? said Cleonitis. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. And then the uh, Nero fiddled while Rome burned, right? Oh, yeah. So okay. they had a... Yes. Okay. Yes. Strength. That's all we're going to say because now we're going on to the church. <laughs> right, I'm finding our uh, my playlist of the history of music. The history of music. Okay. So... What do you want to hear? Sacrum convivium. Yeah, so this is a an example of like early, early church chanting. Okay, so the, that's kind of more mono. Okay, that's good. That's good. So that's, I thought you wanted like general background. No, noise. so that's that's kind of more mono monophonic. Sure, that was just one one guy singing. Right. Yeah. Um. So, uh, Pope Greg <laughs> Gregory he takes he takes credit for all these chants, even though yeah they're not really called Gregorian chanting until like a, a while after he dies. But for some reason they're all attached to him. But they don't really have any anything to do specifically with him. They should really be called uh, Guidoian <laughs> chants. Why is that? <laughs> because Pope. Or not Pope. Was he just Guido? Was he was he just yeah, Guido? Yeah, Guido was just a monk. He was just a monk. Monk Guido. He 
actually came up with like scales and the, the names for notes. Uh, he was Italian, so it was probably like do a rom. I don't know, but uh, it was like the do re mi, basically. Yeah, so they weren't using a letter names for stuff. They actually just had these nonsense names for the musical notes. Yeah. A. Um, <laughs> now we use A. Yeah, A, B, C, D. A, a B. <laughs> but uh, he also came up with, I think what everyone regard like reading music, the whole like notational scale and the yeah. treble clef and the bass clef and the idea of like a note having a time value, all that stuff. Yeah, because before that, you would just listen to someone like singing the thing over and over again and then you'd memorize it. And I'm so sad that we don't do that anymore because like that's how I learn songs and that's how I choreograph and stuff like that. This is how a lot of musicians learn songs. Yeah, so you suck, Guido. I hate you. Famously, the Beatles could not read music. Really? I didn't know that. That makes me like them. Most professional like rock musicians probably can't like sheet read music for like, because why would you? Exactly. <laughs> Guitars have their own notation, actually. We'll talk about later. They do! Tabs! Guitars have tablature. I actually did play the bass. A play, I experimented. I had a bass, and I mm -hmm. experimented with it. And I would get the tabs for it. Yeah, I guitar remember. tab is really... It's really just a different form of music in that, like, it's it doesn't tell you all the things that, like, sheet music would necessarily tell you about, like, uh, how loudly to play the thing or... Or, and it like assumes that you're playing on, on a guitar, so it doesn't worry about like what octave you're in or anything. But it tells you how to play, so it tells you like what fret of what fret of which string you would play. Yeah. It's the equivalent of dance steps almost. Yeah, it tells you it's like the directions. That but you... it's kind of generally assumed you'll play a guitar tablature while having a recording of the song, so that you're just going through the dance steps while listening to it and playing along, and then you get it down. Yeah. Oh. So Guido, he. He wasn't into tabs. <laughs> Not into tabs. No, he wasn't writing lute tabs at the time. But, yeah. But he came up with the Western notation, so good He for did. Um, and then, uh, so Hildegard was this, this cool chick. Yeah, we do have some Hildegard. Oh, she has some bells in there. You can keep playing while I talk about her because it doesn't, yeah, it doesn't get lit until like, there's like three minutes of bells. Okay, so Hildegard is a... She's a mystic. Okay. She was given to... She was sort of like given to um, the church when she was younger because I think her... She was like a tithe. Oh. You know family how, was just like... <laughs> yeah, yeah, like you know how like evil people are like, give me your, for your firstborn. Well, like that was a real thing. Like if you were poor and you couldn't pay taxes, the government, which was the church, was like, give me your first born. Well, give me your tenth born. Is Hildegard in Germany? I and think so. Was Guido in Italy, I'm guessing? Or yeah. Rome? Yeah, I hope I hope he was, because otherwise, okay. otherwise, uh. Okay. Yeah. That wouldn't make any sense if he wasn't. This sounds so, like, like proto-opera almost. Yeah, Hildegard wrote, she wrote a ton of, uh. Sounds like a Valkyrie. Yeah, she wrote a ton of stuff for the Pope, um, and uh, yeah, she was a cool. She was a cool lady. She was. She also had some like weird. She had weird stuff. Like she uh, she whipped herself. She was in. She she wrote the original the original S and M. Rihanna, you can thank her. Yeah, she like she was really into like self flagellation and like getting on her knees for Jesus. Okay. Yeah. But she, uh, there's not a lot of women in music. She was probably like the only one that we're going to talk about until like Lady Gaga. So there I mean, you go. It was the Dark Ages, right? It was. <laughs> yeah. It was the year 1098. So not a lot, not a lot going on. So I'm just going to run, I'll run through this, you know, just a couple of little other things that happened during the. So we should note, like, right in this time period, though, there's like. There's kind of always been this divergence between classical music and a lot of classical music descending from like church music and folk music. And this is like, we're gonna see this throughout the history of American music as well. But at this time you've got troubadours and wandering bards and poets yeah. and people who make a living. There have been entertainers, like traveling entertainers going back like millennia. 
And, but like, that was not necessarily accepted by the church. It was seen as like, probably a lot of the songs that they sang were like very funny and very catchy. And yeah. the church was like, no. Chanting. You can see this in, um, if you watch the incredibly uh, classic movie, The Seventh Seal. Yeah. You can see an example of both of this and the self-flagellation too. Yeah, travel, it was a traveling actor and a bard. Yeah, and there's also people that are like, "Shut up! You're gonna give us the plague with your with your non, you know." Yeah, I think that's more that's set in like, fourteen, fifteen hundreds. Well, that's part of this period. Okay. 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 Um, is that a sound that the cave people made? It sounded like a ring and a scrape. <laughs> yeah, the tongue pop. That's totally a percussive sound. Percussive. They, they, yeah, the cave people just like shade. Okay. Okay, so, so duh, there's, let's see. Yeah, in 11th, the 11th century, France has troubadours. Um, in the 1480s, Luther want, he wants to sing in the church. He's like, why can't the congregation like sing in the church? Oh, like Martin Luther? Yeah. Of the like ninety nine yeah problems ninety nine problems with the church <laughs> is all of them is all of them yeah so Martin Luther one of the like reforms he wanted in the Catholic Church that led to the split with Protestantism was he wanted to sing in church yeah and he was like the original like he's like it should be Gospel Sunday we should be making good music God is here. great <laughs> God is great yeah he he really wanted to do that Pope Leo said no. And Luther started his own church where the congregation could sing together. Wow. Um, I, you know what? I'd say he nailed it. Hey. Ah, good one. But um, yeah, where's our drummer? I should play that Wires song. Where's our drummer? Wires church song. Uh, uh, this time, also, I should say the instruments are classified by how loud they are. Instead okay. of, you know, like, instead of what key they instead of play the in. timbre yeah there it's just like they had like quieter ones and louder ones uh L leonin of notre dame invents uh he he invents poly polyphony like polyphonic sure so like multiple levels like different people singing at different levels right yeah yeah the barbershop quartet yeah, and this is um, this is when he invents. castradas were like Billy starting Joel. out too because they were like, oh yeah, so we need, we need someone to sing the yeah, parts. Yeah, exactly, and they're like, but they're not, like, but, but not, not women, women, not women who are, can naturally do it. Uh, yeah, <laughs> castrate men. Let's just cut the balls off. Yeah. Um, let's see. In 1566, Gesualdo was a very important Italian composer who wrote chromatic madrigals, and he also killed his first wife in a brutally violent manner and then married again and didn't kill that wife. This is Guess Waldo? Okay. Yeah. And this is around around this time, like right before... So do you know what a chromatic madrigal is? I don't know what a madrigal is. Do you know what chromatic means? Like many colors, right? Yeah, or in the in music, uh, chromatic generally means that uh, comprising multiple keys, or semitones or notes that are like not all in one key. So when you talk about a, uh, when I say when I talked earlier about like the key of C or whatever, the key of C actually just has seven notes in it. Okay, so out of the twelve notes you could play, or I guess eight notes out of the octave. Chromatic means all the notes. Okay. Chromatic stuff tends to sound weird. So he was into writing weird, <laughs> he was writing stuff. weird stuff. He was writing weird. He felt weird. Then around this time, uh, there's the devil's the devil's tritone, which I've been I was listening to a playlist of yeah. If you want to play a tritone, I was listening to a playlist of tritones, and it's like very metal, and it's also what is it like? Black Sabbath famously has it, I think, like... So, in part, that's because a lot of heavy metal songs use a a different voicing. They'll play in a key, but they often choose uh, what's called a Phrygian scale. Oh, God. Um, where you play a key, but you effectively start in the second note in the Can you make it, scale. like, for dumb people? 
Probably not with Phrygian. It just sounds Middle Eastern. It's a Middle Eastern way. Okay, I, ooh. But real quick, I'm gonna play for you. I'll just play like a C major scale, and then I'll show you how a tritone sounds compared to that. Okay, so this is like not the devil, and then you'll play me the devil. Yeah, so okay, here's that's just a the... C major, which is sort of a happy, like very white. Oh yeah, <laughs> so white. <laughs> okay. Oh, cute. So that's like a, just a nice C major, and then the tritone, which is the flatted fifth, would be like. Okay, it's dissonant. Can you do like, can you do like the beginning of like a metal song though? Oh, and it's hard on a... I don't know. Uh, it's hard on acoustic guitar. So it's like a it's like a, a jump, right? That's like it it feels unresolved. Yeah, or maybe a Phrygian scale in C. If I take the C I think I have I, like... I think I have it on here actually. I think I have it on our playlist. Cause you cause you want to hear the Black Sabbath? Yeah. Oh, it starts with rain. All these songs are they're they're crazy. They're intros. so they're so dramatic. Watch it. Yeah, that, that, that. Yes, yeah, that's the tritone. Okay, that's go. what I meant. Can so you do that? So that song is just Black Sabbath playing a G. Yes, and now do the the jump. The, yes, that's the tritone. There it is. Which I know it's yes. funny because it's only two tones, but it's and like. And then they play the octave, and then and then they go. Right. Okay. That's that's what I meant. That's what I meant. Yes, yeah. I'm so satisfied. Okay. Well, there you go. Because so you can it. hear that's it. That's it from a G to a. Uh, that's like a D flat. Yeah, 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 and so like, it it has like a, a spooky feeling to it, and it was not banned. Um, people th say that it was banned, but it wasn't. It just like the words change over time. So and there's a lot of debate yeah. about what the exact ratio should be for the since we're talking about the ratio of like the fifth is like a nice like three to two ratio or whatever, right? Or like the octave is just like. A one to two ratio. Yeah. And the tritone is like 45, 30 seconds or whatever. Yeah. And so like it's a... Uh, it's messy. It's, it's messy. messy, bitch. It's, and they didn't like it. Bitch, and the yeah. church said, ew. Yeah. But there's monk... Okay, wait. This is confusing to me now with the guitar. Okay, the monks... Uh, there's still music with monks like singing and there's playlists on Spotify that have they're like the devil's music playlist and it has Black Sabbath and then it has like the monks like and you can hear it you can hear like I can hear it and I don't have like a musically trained ear and I'm like okay yeah those sound similar those yes. like sounds it generally sounds dissonant to yes. a, a western trained ear okay so the renaissance yay we made it out of the dark ages <laughs> It's a it's a passing note, by the way. It is what in a, in like blues music often you'll play your tritone as a passing note. You don't land on it, but you'll kind of like play it in passing. Oh, cute! Oh yeah, that's awesome. I like that. There you go. That's the way as you just gloss over the devil. <laughs> you just like not today, Satan. Yeah, yeah, yes. I love that. Okay. Great job. Back to you. Okay. <laughs> Uh, so there is Renaissance in the 16th century. So there's, they're now 16th century madrigals. They're like these secular songs, <laughs> and they're basically like over Italian poetry. So there was, it was like the original rap. Nice. They were like the original Italian. rappers. Yeah. Um, Italian beat beat poetry. Exactly. Yeah, and they're like, yo, I wanna, I wanna profess my love. Um, yeah. So then. <laughs> Monte Giuseppe, pizza mozzarella. Yeah, pizza mozzarella. Pizza pie yeah, for you. Bonulli effect. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that yeah. <laughs> that happened. Monteverdi made he made moves towards the tonal system and he wanted to put like he had this dream of putting like eight hundred people on stage at the same time, which is be like an orchestra. So Monteverdi is not Verdi. Right. It's yeah. Uh, yeah. He's Green Mountain. 
Mm -hmm. Not just green. Not just green. Okay. Uh, so, you would have put 800 people on stage and they were like, no. Yeah. And then they were like, but what He's if? He's like, yeah, but what if we called it an orchestra? Because it's 800. <laughs> yeah. it was. That was the first Live Aid. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he was... He was like, all right, everybody on the stage. Operas were, it's, operas were invented because they were like, singing is great. Let's just sing about everything. <laughs> like all the things. Um, and then, yeah, Heimlich, he's like a, he's at the end of the Renaissance. He's an important German composer and he's like box like, He's like the before Bach, Bach, Bach C. So, so opera is like developing in that it's like musicals mostly sung in like Latin or like German, I suppose. Yeah. And then uh, they're singing about everything. But like performed in big ass concert halls, and so the singers have to just fucking belt. So the yeah. whole like style and. For example, their interpretations of Vikings is all done to like play to a very large like audience or crowd. So these big elaborate stage movements, giant costumes, super loud singing. Yeah, into the courts is very like all of this is like they're like patrons of the arts basically. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the bar the Baroque. So yeah. It's so now we get to Baroque and it gets it starts getting pretty cool. Yeah. In Baroque, it's really cool. Yeah. I was going to so, make well, the, the the Baroque, you know, if it's not Baroque, don't fix it, right? Yeah, the joke that uh, the clock makes in Beauty and the Beast. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, okay, so what is it? 1680s and onward is now Baroque, and there's a yeah. lot of string pieces, I guess, or a what lot. people will know from this era. A lot. Um in we have some on our playlist too. The like the grand piano had not yet been invented, right? That came around in like the 1700s. Um, it's uh, yeah, in, in this period, but it actually is in this period, but it's like towards the later. Yeah, period. which okay. is very. Yeah. It's a funny thing you don't ever think about. You're like, oh, the like when I listen to like Vivaldi, or which I'm gonna we're gonna get, get to, to in the Baroque period, you're like. They didn't have the piano. That's yet. my they no. They did the... though. They did have the piano. That's why oh, okay. the or no, sorry, uh, Vivaldi. They didn't Bach. They did have the piano. That's yes. why he was so cool. Okay. Anyway, um, Vivaldi. Right, he was like the violin dude. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he played an instrument that sounded like a dying cat. <laughs> Would you like to hear some Vivaldi? When played well, it does not sound <laughs> like a dying cat. He, yeah, he, he wrote the Baroque version of Thriller, known as The Four Seasons, not to be confused with the uh, mediocre hotel chain. The reason chain. it's Thriller is not because of the subject content, but because every track on it is a hit. Yes. Every movement. You probably know the spring movement, because that's the best. Because it's the best ringtone. It's oh, the it best the, ringback ring, tone. This is the ringback tone that my mom probably still has. Okay. Yeah, that's it. You can hear the harpsichord under it. Yeah. There is a little... So yeah, before we get kicked off of something. Um, I think you can play most, plas most classical really? music is out of trademarks. You I know think... Happy Birthday is not is uh, actually copyrighted. Did you know that? Still, somehow. Yeah. Yeah. But anyway. Okay. So, yeah, the <laughs> that is a funny ringback tone. I, w I had a friend who, like, I, I was like, dude, why do you have, like, such a like ridiculous ringback tone and he was like shit i still have that and he like didn't know how to get rid of it it's the default yeah yeah um but yeah he uh he was he was basically like a hook like he wrote hooks basically he was like the ill hook writer um he died in poverty vivaldi yep oh no yeah he died in poverty oh, okay he did well, probably because he liked to drink and because they didn't have cell phones yet. All right. I don't know. Um, well, bummer. Okay, so Bath invented the piano? No, it's... it's Bach? No, it's Bartolomeo Cristo Oh, Barth. Corey. Barth. Did he go by Barth? I, I took sh uh, shorthand notes. Oh, I see. And then I think... Bartolomeo Cristo Forti. 
and he was working for the Medici's. Oh, sick! And he was uh, originally hired to take care of their harpsichords, which are like a precursor to the piano. That's You've so freaking cool. Like, you're not even like the pet sitter, you're like the instrument carer. Yeah, because they have core musicians. It required a lot of like... That's amazing! You, know, you needed a technician for that stuff. So he invented the concept of, yeah, basically the modern piano. And for those of you who have not looked inside a grand piano, you should the next chance you get, or an upright. A piano has what it is actually called a harp inside. And it, a piano is a giant fucking harp. And when you hit the keys, you're hitting hammers that are hitting the harp in the piano. That's how a piano works. What is you got to water pianos. Piano. Like yeah. You broke a bush. Yeah, you do. You have to water them. You got to humidify them. You got to sit on them and look sexy. Well, tuning is a big thing. You oh, and yeah. I have been to venues where like somebody sits down and they're like upright piano in the corner and they're like, oh, fuck. Oh, this sounds like garbage. You need to tune this. And they're like, what? And they're like, yeah, you're supposed to have a guy come out like every year or two and, and uh, play chopsticks on it. Right. Well, the, the harp inside the piano, like, has, like, you know, 70-some big-ass fucking, like, triple-wound strings on it. A piano harp can kill you. They weigh, like, they weigh like yeah. hundreds of pounds. And if they snap, like, when, when you're moving it or if you drop the piano, it, it can, like, people have died from a piano, like, not falling on them, falling next to them and then, <laughs> then breaking open. The shroud, oh my God. There's a lot of, uh, there's a lot of force. That's why harps like, they last like so long. That's why they're like around so long because like you can't kick them out of the band. They just like, they're like, I can kill you with my instrument. If I were to un unstring this harp. If I yeah. would, don't make me unstring it. Well, yeah, so if you went and cut the like strings that are actually inside a piano on the harp, the harp would like spring open and like, yeah, really fuck some shit up. So don't. Don't do that. Don't do it. Uh, Brooklyn, so the Brooklyn Bush claims that a piano only lasts fifty years, even with proper care. Oh I wow! I don't know if that's true. You could you could definitely restring it. Um, yeah, there's Steinways that are certainly much older than that. I mean, he is a famous piano salesman. There are so. Stradivarius. <laughs> there are Stradivarius uh, violins that you know have lasted like hundreds of years. That's a so. different it's a different story. And yes, so. Yeah, so uh, everyone was like, hey, Bach, like, you're, you're like a prodigy, like, cool dude. Like, here's a piano. And he was like, he was like, your piano ain't shit. Like, I am going to use the organ, but I'm going to make piano sounds out of it, which I think is, like, super cool. He was, yeah, he, uh, he oh. wrote a lot of music to make you feel like you are on drugs. Like to make, yeah, he is like, this song is going to wake you up. And then this song is going to make you sleepy. He was also really, really, really loved coffee. And he wrote a song about coffee. He wrote about um, a thousand pieces every week. And he, yeah, he wrote about the art of the fugue. So uh, a neat thing about, right, so Bach, like kind of your first, because he, he was a like very skilled harpsichordist but then like also played piano no he played the organ oh and the organ but no he, he has a, a very famous like series of pieces called the well-tempered clavier which i think is piano pieces okay maybe later but like the, his coolest thing was that he kind of shit on the piano and he was like i'm gonna get these same sounds out of out of the organ oh i see yeah so i have an example of that in the i think i do I think maybe I got one of his piano pieces. We do have I don't some know. Bach. This is a cello suite. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because I, I picked that one because I'm like, that's the one that people know. Yeah. This is played by Yo-Yo, famous violinist Yo-Yo Yeah, Ma. so that's Bach. Uh, he did start out making, like, pretty chill stuff, and then uh, there was, like, wars and shit, and he, like, he was like, all right, I guess I'm going to be, like, pretty epic. So he has some, like, more epic stuff. Also, uh, so... Both Bach and uh, another musician, I think Handel, not not uh, not Haydn, Handel. They were blinded by the same surgeon. Yikes! So he also, yeah, he went blind. Um, there was a surgeon that was coming to town who said that he, he's like, I can do amazing like um, cataract surgery. 
I don't know, he, he died from it. Bach did. Bach died from complications after Oh, that yeah, surgery. from, like, an infection. Yeah, like, crazy pink eye, basically. Yeah, but, but it was funny because, like, this dude is like, yeah, I can do cataract surgery. And he would travel to towns. So he would also get, like, a lot of press because people were like, he can cure you. And he would just basically, like, just, like, stab you in the eye and then skip town before the anesthesia wore off. Oh, so. Yeah. Regarding, yeah, more on Bach is that he was known as an organist. The Well-Tempered Clavier, if you listen to it, it's kind of boring. There is a piece in it, uh, it's like, 24 or 48 songs, and they're each in, like, a different key. Ooh. So he was, like, a nerd. Um, yeah. Used to say. And uh, the piano, it's very funny because right in the two, like, Latin terms for loud, loud is forte, soft is piano. So why is the instrument called a piano? That just means quiet. Yeah, because instruments right? were classified by, like, how uh, loud or soft they no, were. No, it's still. because the original marketing name for the piano was forte piano. Because oh. a piano, the, as originally designed, with like, is you could play it loud or soft. It's very uh, pianos are famously like very dynamic instruments. You can like smash them, or you can like play very gently on it. Oh. So it was called a loud quiet. Is like what it was marketed as, and then they just eventually shortened it to the quiet. Just the um, quiet. They're yeah. like more people will want to be chill on this. But. Uh, yeah, prior to that, like a harpsichord or a lot of other like instruments, you didn't have as much dynamic control uh, when oh, you were yeah. playing them. So yeah, the forte piano, they were like, look at the dynamic range on this baby. Fits so, so, mm. <laughs> so many sonatas in here. Sonatas. Okay, so okay. now we're getting to the exciting part, the second exciting part, which is the classical period, which is it's funny because... Yeah, they called it classical back then because they knew. They knew most of their dudes <laughs> would be from this period. Um, so there is in France, there is this thing called like the galant, which just means cool, the galant style. So they're just like, yeah, we're going to get like a lot of really cool sounding people up in France right now. Uh, Salier invents the symphony, which is... Isn't it just like an orchestra with more people? <laughs> yeah, so uh, a symphony is, well, no, an orchestra would be like kind of everybody in a symphony generally is going to be like strings. Okay. So it'll have like a, it's primarily string based, I guess. Okay. Where the thing is like orchestra is you've got your timpanis and all your woodwinds and everything else. Okay. Um, symphony, I think, is more collections of string instruments. Well, he and invented then you still the got your like quartets and other stuff. He thought it up. That was his dream. He was like, "What if we put? But what if we put all the string instruments?" Can I, can I pass on a uh, a factoid? Yeah. It's a really long from, one. I this can is from see. the Brooklyn Bush. Um, so talking about the longevity of pianos, and that they generally only work last about 50 years right yes um and after that they start to get loose and at some Ooh. point i guess you just replace them the best ones can last 70 years and then the fun fact about bach he hated this one lady who liked to throw her head back on low notes and forward on high notes so he wrote a song to, that made her look like a chicken that's great i love that or he just was like i really want to get some dome from this chick oh <laughs> he's like i'm gonna be yeah, he's like, uh, when I play this, you're just going to be sitting so, under the piano. Uh, I take it back. So the key is that a, a symphony is the piece of music played by the orchestra. Okay, cute. So, so there you go. So, so a symphony is written for an orchestra. Okay. So the other guy who like dreamed of the orchestra, Salieri, is like, I see you, bro, in the past. I got you, boo. <laughs> um, so there's these... That's really funny that it's called a... I guess it's sort of like a movie theater is a symphony orchestra. Yeah. It's like thing that it plays and then the thing that plays it. Yeah. You learn something new every day. There you go. So there are these guys that go to school in Vienna together. Mozart, Haydn, and Beethoven. You might have heard of them. They, wait, no, they weren't contemporaneous. What? Uh, Mozart and Haydn were, I believe. Beethoven was uh, much later. 
wasn't Beethoven born like 50 years after Mozart, I think. Okay. So Mozart and Haydn go to school together. <laughs> I oh, think they went to the no, same school. No, I take school. it back. 14 years. All right. Yeah. I, I'm pretty sure. I'm like... I took really good. I took really good notes. Mozart I had many a, sources. Mozart got a fourteen-year head start, but died thirty years before Beethoven did. Yes. Okay. So they all go to school together, which is like super cool. They were like bros. They were like in the same frat or whatever. So Mozart, he wrote his first symphony when he was eight years old. He loved cats, and he actually wrote a some. He wrote like a little piece about like a cat. It's like it has like. There's music and then there's like a response, which is like someone meowing. So they're writing this music, right? Like in the 1790s, early 1800s, yeah. right? And so like this is when like Hamilton is taking place. Yes. On our historical timeline. The play? Yeah, like the events of the play Hamilton. Oh, I thought you meant, I was time. like, I was like, wow, I didn't know that guy. The guy is really old. No, because right, the American Revolution is like 1770s. Yeah. Right. And then like. You know, Constitution well, George is, Washington or 1780s, then, like, these guys is, are around. This is why nothing's happening musically in America right now, because yeah. they're they're busy. And then early 1800s, you got Napoleon and everything okay. going on, too. Well, we saying, are still in the 1700s There's larger right historical now. currents happening in the context in which they're writing this crazy-ass music. I was thinking of the context of, in France, there's Marie Antoinette. Mm -hmm. Like, that whole, like, the last... Yeah, Kings the, and, the fall of the monarchy. Yeah, is happening. So they were these people were getting, they were getting like punk rock a little <laughs> bit. They were like, "Wow, I sense, I sense trouble." Sure. I feel trouble. The French French Revolution's happening. So, yeah, I just have fun facts about that. Like, so Mozart. Oh yeah, we have Mo we have examples of these people. So let's listen to some of these these people. Yeah. So Mozart, he was like the young one. He only wrote eight, uh, oh no, sorry, he wrote 41 uh, symphonies. Yeah, none of them wrote, all, they all were like super prolific. Except for about, Beethoven, like, uh, he only wrote nine. Symphonies though, right? And they were constantly writing like operas, like Mozart wrote like several operas. Um, yeah. And just like pieces for the court or for like, they would write a piece for like, my like the Viennese Archduke is visiting like some other king and I will play like an original piece for them and they would like write it and then perform it. So uh you wanted to hear Mozart. We'll Mozart start with Mozart. Mozart. Here. Who unfortunately I feel like I look I don't like know if your list has much. It doesn't anything. have Mozart? Mozart. You left it out. Yes, yeah, I don't really like it. him that much. You're gonna have to sing the Mozart. <laughs> I don't really care. Uh I don't like him. He's the worst. All right, I'm gonna play you uh, a little bit of Mozart. Okay, maybe I'll maybe this will change my tune. <laughs> By the way, the song we opened with, Fur Elise, is was Beethoven. Yeah, I have Beethoven in there because I I am a stan, but Mozart, I'm just like, meh. Meh. really? Mm-hmm. Try and change my mind. Okay, so here's a song you might like from Mozart. his best work. I do love that song. Oh, you forgot. Yeah. You forgot about forgot the hits, didn't you? You hit. forgot he wrote this one, didn't you? Yeah, I sing the song every night. <laughs> yeah. Lily pointed this out to us, actually, so thanks, Lily, for that. The Mozart effect. So he's very, Mozart very famously was, would write, could, like, improvise and write incredible embellishments for his stuff. He'd be like, now I'll play it in the style of Haydn. Here we go. And just like do it. Yeah, he was kind of like uh, a loose cannon. He wrote. There was one opera where they're like, "You forgot to write." He was like drinking, and they're like, "Dude, you didn't write like the big part for that opera." And he was like, "No worries." And he like wrote it on a napkin, and he's like, "It'll be great." Um, and then it was. I and mean, it was. Oh, I do like this one. <laughs> I like this one. Okay, maybe I like him. Okay, whatever. Oh, you forgot about this too. I like this one because it's in Marie Antoinette. I mean, it just. Uh... It's so evocative, right? It just sounds like the Baroque era. Yeah, it does. Like, oh, yes. Yeah. It's very pretty. I do like that one. Okay. So this uh, this is a little night music. Ina Klein and Nacht music. Yeah, I do like that one. Okay. So you take it back. <laughs> I take it back. He's the best. All right, <laughs> Sorry, okay. Mozart. All right. I'm glad I look like you. Continue. He died young because... 
he probably had a tooth issue that he didn't get checked out. To toxic shock. Or he so, left his uh, tampon in for too long. <laughs> right? Isn't that the other way you get toxic shock syndrome? Um, yeah, people are like, he was poisoned by his, uh, his rival. But that's probably not true. Because he was all the poisons that they would have used on him, he was probably taking them anyway for like medication. So yeah. Okay. Um, Haydn was like, they had a lot in common. He really liked food. He was super into like the string quartet and he like invented the idea of a string quartet, I guess. Right, so stripped down from like uh, an orchestra. Yeah. He wrote 104 symphonies. I have the symphony count for all these books. I don't know why. Let me go back to our, uh, to our, playlist. our playlist. I think we might have see some Haydn on some, there. I believe there is some Haydn here. Here you go. Here's a cello concerto. Cello concerto. It sounds like a, a wedding. Yeah. Um, Beethoven, he only wrote nine symphonies, but he's like my favorite because he was like the emo person. <laughs> he was like getting super into like emo music and like he was a hopeless romantic. So a lot of people call him the like romantic, but he's not. He's still like the last person in this um, era. He... Oh, he, he studied with, with Haydn. Like, him and Haydn were, like, friends. Mm -hmm. um, he joined the Illuminati. Beethoven did. Yeah. Okay. He proposed to a 19-year-old when he was 40 years old, and she said no because she, she was like, you're too emo. He was basically, like, the, um, the Byronic hero of the... Yeah, I mean, his songs, we'll play some like The Ninth, for example, but some of his transitions are just insane. They sound like uh, a manic depressive person. And I, he's my number one favorite of ever because of The Clockwork Orange, because Beethoven's Ninth, which is the one that I have in there, is the one that, um, that Alex loves in the clockwork yes. orange and yeah so he loves all this violence but he's also like super into classic music and he's like he's like ludwig von like he's like just freaking out about him like the whole movie and uh, and book mm. <laughs> so yeah i put that one in there if you want to play that one which yeah so this is the uh second movement yeah and that's uh, yeah it's in and then he also wrote Ode to Joy. So the ninth is very like busy, right? It's very kind of yeah. Like, a lot of these fast little dun, 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 dun. these little like triplets. But uh, so Ode to Joy is also in the ninth. Um, so the ninth symphony is regarded as. Uh, it both is like when his, after he wrote it, he was deaf at the time. It, he wrote it for an orchestra that was larger than any he'd ever composed for. He was right? showing off. He's like, now I'm going to go deaf, and now I will do my greatest work. So it's, yeah. I mean, people have like music historians and other people have been like stumped by this because he couldn't. He never heard this played except in his own head, as he was writing it. But like the in like a a like you know, a smaller verse of it, there will be like three bassoon parts and like two like trumpets going and a timpani and like four strings or whatever. Like, yeah. And he like, that's like a quieter section. And then, so he wrote it and it just basically blew the minds of all of his contemporaries. They were like, <laughs> so like they're actually, they were like, we have to start a new era of music. Yeah, and after him, they nobody could match it. They were like, we give up. It kept Gotta numerous other composers do. from even writing anything. They all then like referenced him and copied him against their own will because it was like everything. The ninth was like everything. And then it also had a curse associated with it. So composers actually became very superstitious that once they wrote their ninth, they would die. 
And they did, and then they killed themselves. And I think it maybe happened a couple times. It was like the um, original Twenty Seven Club. But it it was a the Ninth Symphony is a, the equivalent to like a mic drop or whatever on his career. It's like I don't, I don't know what the equivalent would be releasing Bohemian Rhapsody or like just being like yeah figure out but how the genre yeah. should evolve after this you know he made like, himself deaf too so like that it was a mic like i wasn't kidding when he's like no i'm gonna make myself just, what deaf. just from endless rehearsing no he was also like really superstitious and like you know whatever and he would like like i said he joined the illuminati so people were like oh maybe they killed him but they Why didn't did that make him deaf no but what made him deaf was that he used to dunk his head in um in cold water all the time before he would perform and they think he just got like major swimmer's ear oh, no shit. yeah because like one day he didn't have time to like shake it out shake it out of his so you want to hear so the uh the last movement of the ninth yeah oh to joy everyone knows that one but like you've maybe like if you heard an orchestra play ode to joy because it gets just crazy at the end let no, me, let me skip, I haven't. Let me just skip. Could you just imagine hearing this in like a okay, concert Okay, I'm going to close my eyes. I'm going to go blind for a second. And it's like the early 1800s, and there's, and I'm going to jump. It is. <laughs> well, in the, in in the Clockwork Orange in the movie, like, because they took this part out of the book or something like that. But at the end, when they, like, reverse, they reverse Alex's, like, yeah, yeah. thing, he's, like, on this red carpet or something, and he's, like, having sex with this girl and, like, also punching someone. As, and the, Bro- would... as the Brooklyn Bush says, it's so many montages, so many movie montages yeah. set to it because it gets so but hyper. But it's always violent. It's always, like, a violent montage, I feel like. It's always, like, a yeah. slow motion, like, someone, like, punching someone's teeth out of their mouth. So, uh, there are entire podcast episodes from uh, on other channels that are devoted just to oh to joy like, even no just to like the first movement okay. of the ninth symphony or yeah or well just then a, that podcast the sucks. don't listen to it um, don't listen to that no podcast. it's great we don't get into all the details but there's so many different things in the ninth okay. symphony that were mind-blowing at the time and beethoven just did all of them and then mic drop and every other composer was like fuck <laughs> like just if i if i did one of like the 10 crazy things he did i would be a genius yeah Anyway. Then he died. We'll play the fifth real quick. Because everybody, Wait, the everybody fifth? knows the Beethoven's Fifth Symphony real okay. quick. Okay. Because like... we have to play it on a music okay. an episode. Okay, okay, okay. Ready? Okay, let's go. Let's do it. Let's play it. The fifth. Oh, yeah. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then the little mice come in. The little mice? <laughs> Yeah. That's strange. Okay. Who invented that stick? What's the composer's the conductor stick. Um, I guess we'll get to it. You know, your boy Li- Lily from uh, like back away is the court uh, composer. He had a, a staff that he Lully would... Lully in the court of Louis the Fourteenth. He would keep time with his staff and he like, that's how he died actually because he would like, you know, like, um, bang it on the ground and he stabbed himself in the foot one time and then he died and then he died of an infection yeah Yeah. and he wouldn't i think he refused they were like we can amputate your your foot and like save your life because you're gonna get gangrene and die and he was like he's like i meant what i said well he was like no then i can't dance oh true true true. yeah that's what i do Yeah. yeah okay Okay, let's, so let's then, keep it moving yeah. again. Sorry. Beethoven so dies. Stop on Beethoven. They play that at his funeral. Mm-hmm. And uh, now we have the romantic era. I have a little heart next to it. Okay. Uh, All righty. So Schubert writes 600 songs. One is about a trout. He has cool hipster glasses. You ever heard a song about a trout? <laughs> yes. Okay. Uh, nice. He's like the hipster of this time. Mm-hmm. Everyone talks about his glasses. Uh, 
I see Chopin coming up. Yeah. Oh no, Berlioz. Berlioz writes a vengeful, opium scorned love situation, and he invents the light motif, but he does not popularize it. Okay, so the concept of the light motif for those listening uh, is that Star Wars really <laughs> is the best modern example of my fourth drought song. <laughs> Thank you, Franklin Bush. He's a he's a prodigious composer. Um, yeah, leitmotif is in every opera. When a character comes out, they have a little musical like signature. Yeah, and in Star Wars, Darth Vader. Dun, so dun, we'll get dun, to dun, it. Dun, Should dun, I play dun. our? We'll jump ahead to John Williams real quick. Whoa! Right, you hear that, and you're like, oh shit, Darth Vader. Yeah, um, you're like, oh no. But like Luke and Leia also have, and you know them if, if you hear them, their own like little musical signature whenever they come out, and you're like, oh, it's hopeful. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah. But that is, uh, to his credit, John Williams introducing it to cinema, but like has been in opera for centuries. Yeah. Um, so. So yeah. Yeah. Going back, so he invents it, but he doesn't popularize it. And then Chopin. Chopin, I just have Chopin writes crazy ass piano. Yeah, you want to hear a romantic song? Yeah. Listen to how emo this shit is. This This is what's known as the raindrop prelude. It's one of my favorite classical pieces. Really? Yeah, this song's beautiful. Because it sounds sort of like a little... Did you write it for me? (laughs) Yes, I went back and told Chopin to write it for you. Is it gonna pick up or no? It's it does. Good. It's got a. It's got a like a great drop. <laughs> because I heard that like Chopin, they say he played with like three hands, like because his piano it gets like so fast. Yeah, and there actually is a technique called three hand piano, where is, it. I mean. It is playing uh, in a way that sounds uh, like you have three. Hands. Like mm-hmm. Three. Yep. That's what the. Yeah. That's what they call it. There's no like 15 second skip on it. It does pick up. Yeah. Give it a second. There's no 15 second skip on it. Spotify doesn't know. I think it does. Just fast forward it. I mean, it's coming. I. It is coming. Okay. It's. I'm like, is it? There it I is. Don't know. So then, like the thunder clouds gather because it's the raindrop. Oh, that's so cute. He's like a burlesque performer. Shout out to Tiger Bay. And this low stuff starts coming in. Ominous. Okay. When does it get like crazy though? Chopin mostly just wrote piano music, so it all sounds like that. But I, but he has more stuff that's like really fast, though. That's like that's like will break piano people. Um, he does. He he has a lot of. That's like, what I wanted. That's a, what a that's his, what people think. So of. he famously wrote a lot of preludes, which are like right the introductory piece of music. But he wrote a ton of them as like practice pieces, basically. But yeah, it drove a lot of students crazy. Yeah, that's kind of what I'm. That's what people know him for. I think. Is no, like, they know the raindrop prelude. Okay. That's what, that's what we're all here for. They're like, he made me go crazy. Um, yeah, I'll play you. I think I got a faster one. Um, well, I, I have so many other. Okay. Oh, yeah, like that kind of. Okay. All right, we get the idea. Okay, it was cute. It was cute. I, we have like you. You're next. You knew that nocturne. You're next. Franz Liszt. Franz Liszt, the original rock star. Yep. So he also is a piano prodigy, contemporary of Chopin's. Yes. But he was way hotter. Mm-hmm. Way he's so hot. There's so many hot pictures of him. He looks just like you. Um. Yeah. So many people wanted his hair that he had to get a dog with the same kind of hair as him. To like <laughs> to give away, yeah. He would trim the dog. But... Yeah, because he was like, "I'm gonna go bald." That's amazing to send locks of your dog's hair to people. Yeah, and he was he popularized playing in profile. Oh, because because his manager or whatever was like prior to that, what people played with their back to the audience. Yes, yeah. oh, and wow. so for him, they were like, "You gotta you gotta show people this mug, honey," because they were gonna be like, "You're kind of like Chopin, but like not as good." But if they see your face, instant panty dropper. So, oh, and he um, he has this 
song called Hungarian Rhapsody, and that is <laughs> that Great is enough. yes, Bohemian Rhapsody is based upon that. So yeah, those are my fun Franz list. My list of Franz. <laughs> my list. list of Franzes. My Franz list. <laughs> Yeah, he. That's great about the dog. Okay. Isn't that awesome? This is like the best one. Then there's let's keep it rolling. Rossini. <laughs> so Rossini did the Barber of Seville, which is like the Bugs Bunny, like da 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 da, like that one. I think I have that. One. Yeah. Uh, Verde. Is that a? Is that on our list? It is. Verde. Uh, he did music for a Doritos commercial. And he went to school with Wagner. Um, Wagner. I see Wagner on here. Sorry, what is the other? Rossini. I might not have put it. Who cares? It's fine. No. People know what it is. Just imagine Bugs Bunny with some scissors. Yeah, and the hair tonic. Yeah, with the monster. <laughs> right. Okay. So yeah, so I like I said. Let's hear some Wagner then, right? You didn't catch my Doritos commercial joke. Verde, Verde did the all the Doritos commercials use Verde music. Uh, Verdi. Yeah. Like. <laughs> So he went to college with Wagner. It's great because he wrote that and that's epic, right? And yeah. There's another Verdi. The pizza commercial song. Yup. He loves it. He loves uh he loves cheese. <laughs> Yeah, he was like, what if... It's great because it's just... He was like, what if a bunch of Italian teenagers live in the Jersey Shore? Yeah, it's like, what's the most Italian song I could And also, what if... What if they make microwaveable pizzas on bagels and they need it... They need a commercial music. So, yeah. Also, Carousel. From, uh, in Central Park, I think that's like one of the songs yeah. used in the Carousel. So, that that is from the opera La Traviata, Act 1. Just the pizza. The pizza. <laughs> Act one, the pizza. Um, Act two, the pie. So yeah, Verdi writing, the, writing a lot of stuff. A lot of, a lot of American food. Okay, Wagner, he does the ring cycle, which is like a 15 hour. Um, As you know from Apocalypse Now. Yes, and he also did 2001 A Space Odyssey. What's up? Dun, or the 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 uh, dun, 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 dun. yeah. He has. And I guess Kubrick likes his Wagner. Yeah, he has some fun facts about him. So he's all of his music is pretty like masculine, right? Well, this one's about. Okay, no, say yes. This one's about flying warrior babes. So sure. Say yes, like right. His okay. it sounds like masculine, it's like war and like space and like penis music, right? Sure. But he really, really liked. He really liked to. Cro he really liked to cross dress. Oh, was, Wagner did. Yeah, wow. he loved. He loved it, and his wife was like. She was down. She was like, "This is it's what my husband like wants." And she would Tom of Finland kind of thing, I guess. Where it's like very, he's very masked, but in a gay way. Oh yeah, I mean he lo he he loved um, like dresses made out of like silk and satin. And his wife journaled a lot, and so people were like, "Oh, these dresses could have been for his wife," but like she never wrote about any of the dresses, so they're like, "No, they couldn't be." And uh -huh. there's like. I think there's a rumor that he like died in one of the dresses or Probably something. Died in dress. He was trying it on and he oh. was like, I'm drop dead gorgeous, and then he died. Wait, we didn't play any of my music, by the way. Can I play a little list? Oh yeah, Franz List, the original rock star. It's mostly like he mostly I think it was pretty chill and has a lot of just like very pretty piano music. And look, he's in profile on his album cover, because he had that he had that great jawline. That was true. There's a, a photo. The photo. I'm kind of making it out. It's a little more real. The camera's all focusing. There we go. There's your list. 
Okay, so then we have in our, um, so we have Sati, 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 I don't know. Okay. He's a film composer, so, uh, so he used, like, a bunch of this, like, music for his. What are we, we're now in, like, the late 1800s? What's the time period we're at here? Oh, no. Uh, um, okay, maybe he comes a little bit later. Okay. So we'll talk about Tchaikovsky because Tchaikovsky has some like interesting stuff about him personally. Eric Satie, French composer, yeah, um, influential artist in late nineteenth, early twentieth century. He was a Parisian avant garde. Okay, we'll get to him in a sec. Let's okay. talk about Tchaikovsky. Sure. Okay, so Tchaikovsky was beloved by the inventor of Christmas music. The inventor of Christmas music. Also Swan Lake, and yeah, he... The first famous Russian composer. Yeah, so he was gay. He was in love with, but not out, obviously, because he would have been dead, um, because he was in Russia. And he was in love with his cousin named Vladimir, but he got, like, a beard, basically. He, He was like, I really need to fight... Like, I need to, like, shove it down. I need to, like, go back into the <laughs> the uh, Matrioska mm. doll closet. And he, he, there's a, one of his students that, like, professed her love to him. And he was like, what a great opportunity. So they got married. Um, it obviously didn't work out, but she wouldn't divorce him. So he lived with, like, his sister or something. So um, mid 1800s, so 1840 to 1893. He and he wrote Swan Lake. He did. He was bankrolled by a widow. Like there was some some old widow who was like, "I will pay for you. I'm super into your music." And he was like, "Cool." So it is interesting. A lot of the music we've been talking about thus far, like the famous composers, that they were like compose a song in their own right for like an orchestra, like that was a performance. It's just the musicians, or it was an opera with like singing and like. The interaction but not too many like ultra famous composers did ballets right well, he loved the ballet and he would go to the ballets with his friends so check, and check, they would yeah. stand in the back and imitate the ballet dancers because he loved it so much like yeah. they would do like the oh, you yeah. know yeah so tchaikovsky is probably the maybe the most famous like yeah music for ballet composer because i don't know any songs that like he was very wrote. He was starting to go he was starting to go crazy. He was this like closetedness was like really fucking him up. So he had all he was hypochondriac and he would always hold his head because he was afraid like when he was composing or playing or whatever, he was afraid his head was gonna fall off if he didn't hold it. Just like, okay. Um and then his death is like really it's controversial. Did you know how he died? <laughs> that is swan controversial. It's a black swan flies into the sea. Yeah. <laughs> Which is kind of like Darth Vader, isn't it? Oh yeah, it's super. Isn't this very Darth Vader-esque? This is more just built filling in a theme with, you know, brass. But yeah. Yeah. And then it so, goes back to the white swan. Do you know how he died? Uh, no, how did Tchaikovsky Don't look it up. Okay, I'll tell you. So it's very controversial. I think this is so interesting. He died of cholera. However, people think it might have been suicide. Okay. Which, like, think about that. Like, for a hypochondriac to be like, I'm just gonna drink, like, I'm gonna drink a fucking glass of, like, cholera water. Because at the time, Russia was basically built on, like, a swamp. And there was like all this like sewage and stuff, and you knew that you. Oh, so you shouldn't drink the water. You shouldn't drink your tap water. You had to boil it first. And then you, so that's a very slow way to die. To yeah, it took him yourself. like a year to die. Well, he had he got the cholera like and yeah, and then it was too late. But it's controversial because like yeah, people were like he was a hypochondriac. Like why would he have? Why wouldn't have he? Like, it wouldn't have been, like, an accident. Like, people were saying that he was just very depressed and he was like, mm-hmm. I don't care anymore. Maybe a friend gave him a glass of water. No, he, I think his brother or something said no, that this he... this is my favorite Tchaikovsky. Oh, yeah. Is this the sneaky one? 
When they're, <laughs> is this the one where they're like spying on the, oh, it's, yeah, the Sugar Plum Fairy? Yeah. yeah. It is a sneaky intro though. It's got the little pizzicato strings. They're like, dad's asleep. We're going to go get some candy. Or use the bells too. Yeah. You know, I feel like this is the music that people play when they're giving you a tour of their Christmas tree. And this is them panning down. Well, yeah, sure. The Nutcracker Sweet Famous Christmas. Yeah. Um, okay, okay, okay. I, oh, I'm getting okay. nervous. I'm we're getting going, nervous. I'm like, uh oh. I'm like, we're going to get banned. Who's next? Um, but yeah, isn't that. I'm just like hung up on the cholera. I think that's so, like. This, what a fucking oh, way to commit suicide. I okay. I feel you're making a big deal out of it here. I like. I read like a whole like thing on it too about like people were kissing his uh, corpse and they were like they were like the standards had changed like the cholera rules they were wiping his mouth off because people loved him so much they were like we have to kiss him but if he died of cholera uh, the germs so yeah they don't give a shit about the cholera tell me about Stravinsky um he did the rite of spring okay and yeah, because he was like, let's bring it back to like pastoral like music where I grew up in like the countryside of of Russia. He was like the West Virginian of uh, <laughs> he was like the banjo musician of uh, of Russia, and he yeah he made a folk ballet. So, so this is like the beginning of what's like you know termed like the neo the neo period where they did Matrix. <laughs> I guess just modern. It's modern music or yeah. neoclassical or whatever. And so, yeah, Stravinsky did... When did uh, Rite of Spring? It was like early 1900s it premiered, right? Yeah. In Russia. And there's like a riot or people were like pissed off about it. They were... Yeah, they were upset because it, it was so grating to them. And I have that in our playlist. I have the Rite of Spring thing, the, oh. the one that that made everyone go nuts because they were, well, people think that they rioted because it was a bunch of sort of like older people and younger people. And the older people were like, oh crap, this is younger people, like new music. And they felt really old and sad that they were old. So they, they were like, let's, let's destroy this place. (laughs) Let's burn it down. Yeah. Yeah. So... Is your right of string? So it starts out, you're like, okay. But that's, oh. Wait, this is the one you were thinking of, though. Yeah, it gets pretty crazy, though, I think, isn't it? No, the. I know the piece Oh, it's because of, people were mad at that one, too, because that's a bassoon. And someone, someone was like, that's not a bassoon. This, like, atonal shit. Yeah. In the right of spring. But he also tuned everything to, like, weird tunages. Like, right? He said the bassoon. There's someone that was like, if that's a bassoon, I'm a baboon. Yes. And the dancing was also very, like, anti ballet. Yeah. Movements and, like, primitive, like, punched. We have a ballet stuff. episode if you want to hear more about that. Okay. Um, so, so it's worth noting, I don't think he's on your list, but Stravinsky, right, he's he's pulling this, like, new classical shit and pissing everybody off in Russia in the early 1900s, and Dvorak oh, yeah, I don't know. Is, is doing the same thing. He actually is, he's regarded as, Dvorak is, like, a very funny composer because he's regarded basically as the first, uh, like, I guess, world-famous American classical composer, but the irony is he's Czech. He's like from the Czech Republic, mm-hmm. was born there. He only spent three years in America studying, or he was a professor and had a professorship in New York City. And that's actually when he wrote his greatest, like most famous pieces. And he's very famous for incorporating, uh, like, uh, I guess American folk, it's Negro spirituals, right? And that like, I think that term is okay still. That's the name of the like genre. Okay. We're not, I don't think we'll get canceled. I think that is the like term. That you're allowed to use. Okay. Uh, anyway, black folk music basically. He takes like songs from 
more popular in the South, but like by this point had spread around, but like black folk music and incorporated it into what are more or less like Czech like symphonies. Oh, that's right. And wild. so there's a mix of both going on in his songs. Um or in his like his symphonies, I guess. Uh so that like is seen as or is regarded as ironically it took an outsider because a lot of all the American composers in this period in the early 1900s were trying to sound as European as possible. And that was still like what they followed. And it took an outsider, this Czech guy to show up and be like, well, there's some really great American music. Oh yeah. Um, and apparently his, his main influence, I forgot the man's name was uh, like a, a janitor at like Columbia where he was like a professor. No way. And so he met this guy and was like, what, and that guy was singing while working, and apparently he like met him. And was like, "What are you singing?" And he's like, "Oh, it's like a, it's a you know, it's a church song or whatever." And he was like, "Wait, sure he was like are. a beautiful mind." Yeah, kind but of. Like, he's like solved this. <laughs> this might be the popularized version, but that that uh that guy that the custodian or whatever, like he became famous as well as like, uh, and he didn't have I guess the the background in Western, like, musical training, so he wasn't a student of Dvorak, but he was, like, associated with him. Dvorak, I think, is how it's pronounced. Anyway, that's my co contribution. Oh, to that, yeah. Well, yeah, then it's, I have, like... Or modern oh. classical composers. Right, and then I was seeing Satie? Uh, Satie? Yeah. He was the, the original film composer guy. He, and just, he hated the sun... He carried a hammer with him for protection. He ate only white foods and he started his own church and he was like the only member of the church. <laughs> Super weirdo. But he did, uh, he like got into composing music for films. Huh. So that's what I wanted to talk about him. There's also, yeah, at this time, like, there's jazz, right? Like, which we talked about in our Roaring Twenties. Um, because, wait, what is it? Oh. This is more Jorak. It sounds like the Jaws theme song, though. It does. Oh my gosh, someone stole that from him. Yikes. Dude, it is the Jaws theme. Oh my god. <gasps> Copyright infringement. <laughs> That's the song the janitor was singing. Can I call out, uh... Oh yeah, sorry, continue your... So there's general. jazz, right? So now we're like exploding to like, in America, there's like jazz, there's music, there's musical musicals. Um, so to be, I mean, also for that, it's not like, I mean, this is really just folk music taking like, kind of taking over, taking the place of classical music because like, you know, bluegrass or like the blues or spirituals or like vaudeville songs, right? They've been around since like the turn of the century. Yeah. Like we're around since 1900 or whatever, but they like became dominant cultural forces at this point. Yeah, and particularly jazz music really like kind of took over everything. There wasn't as much enslaving and- uh, <laughs> Much um, music got better basically. Yeah, the music was just um, being awesome. With the Harlem Renaissance, I suppose. Yeah. Having a lot of it. And uh we have a Roaring Twenties podcast. We can listen to that. We can listen to that. Uh, um, I, I want to call one other guy around this time. Okay. It's sort of one of your last uh, pre this period before we move on from this is Rachmaninoff, who was like late 1800s. Oh, yeah. That dude. Okay. Who's a just an outrageous. He's tall as hell. He's six foot six Russian composer with famously huge hands. Uh, virtuoso pianist, but also like uh, a composer and conductor. I guess he would be sort of the end of the late, the late Romantic period. So end of Romantic period. I want to play one of his tracks because okay. his stuff just sounds like crazy piano music for giants. Um, <gasps> I love that. Is that the name of his like album? Yeah, let me, let me pull one of those off the playlist. Um. Put it. There we go. I'm gonna skip through it a little bit. This is actually this recording is played by a woman, Valentina. Oh. Lisitsa. 
Oh, because they didn't have recordings back then. Just listen to how like crazy the piano gets. Oh yeah. That sounds like it sounds yeah. like a kid like that sounds like me playing the piano. You couldn't go that fast. No, no, I just mean like it sounds like you know, someone making something up. It doesn't sound like for real. Yeah. I mean Yeah, that's what I mean by like a little kid like just like someone just being like Like, I don't like it. It sounds like someone, like, messing around. Like, ew. Okay, that's, like... Yeah, it's, like, weird. Like, who wants to listen to that? I think that's so cool. I don't know. I don't <laughs> I think that's know. really cool. I mean, that's cool. I like Is that. Is an arpeggio that spans four octaves or whatever? I, I don't know what that means, though. I can't imagine how it looks when the person's playing it. I'm just, like, it just... just yeah. It just sounds like someone just like pressing random keys to me. I mean, that's part of it. Just in half a second, moving your hands from left to right, where you hit each key on the piano as you like, just just the motor. But you can like do, do that if you just crazy, go like, you know, while hitting exactly the right sixteen oh, notes in the okay. right like, you know, exactly as you move your hands both ways. I have an like, untrained. Uh, it is wild. An untrained ear. Uh, so I, to me, it just, it just sounds the same as someone just like, you know, swiping their hand. Oh, well, listen to more classical music. I, I think I will have okay. to. So, so Rachmaninoff, last of our romantic composers, went to the... Now into the, like what the hodgepodge times modern classical it's like generally termed. I Jazz is modern classical? Oh, I thought you were going to talk about John Cage. Oh, I just have him in there because he was stupid and he did he was like silence is the hardest instrument so he has like an album of silence 433 yeah so it's, it's exactly four four minutes 33 seconds of him sitting at piano not playing it yeah he's like i can play silence um yeah we could we should probably just do another podcast in the future just on like music of the 20th century yeah oh totally i mean so i just the evolution have evolution of jazz to rock and roll you know jazz to blues to rock and roll to uh edm to the final oh, yeah, the, the big... final form of uh deep house which i believe is the finale of all music <laughs> the ending of music <laughs> the end to of minimal music. techno yeah yeah, so it ended with those four minutes of silence. Um, and 33 seconds of silence. I'm like, that is a boss move, but also, like, you're the you're the music equivalent of, like, the white canvas dude. Yeah, Mark Rothko. Yeah. I suppose, yeah. But uh, he's like, this canvas took me a year to paint. This sounds took me a year to rehearse. Yeah. Um, yeah, there's, there's a couple other, if we wanted to stick on the... What we have been terming the like classical composers. There's a couple more we can mention from the 20th century. So we talked before about the the like motif and John Williams, who kind of like made it very famous for cinema in uh, right in Star Wars. But then he also wrote another song that you might know. Jurassic Park. Yeah, Jurassic Park is the best. A little right of spring there, right? Oh yeah, he totally stole. <laughs> so John Williams has been accused infinitely, and he kind of doesn't give a shit of like plagiarism or yeah. plagiarizing his own works, or it's like whatever though, right? Yeah, it's like who's gonna tell? Like who, I'm sure these guys will be glad to be like dinosaur soundtrack. Well, and it's it's such a perfect song for seeing like the the brontosaurus like eating yeah <laughs> like petting the brontosaurus oh my gosh yes. that brontosaurus petting. steven spielberg you genius um and when you go to that amusement park sometimes when you go to jurassic park land they have this playing and you're like i'm in jurassic park wait where like disney disney oh. or whatever i don't know universal universal, universal sorry yeah, yeah. Anyway, yeah, great track. And uh, we should also mention um, Philip Glass is probably the most famous, like, late 20th century, what you, again, term modern classical composer. So if you haven't seen it, there's this film, Koyaanisqatsi. There's two other films in this trilogy. 
it was like one of the first ever films shot for IMAX and it's just absolutely stunning footage of like the natural world followed by footage of New York City in the 19 like late 70s early 80s um and Koyana Scotsky I guess is a uh like Aztec word that means life out of balance and so it just contrasts like all the natural footage with this like very gorgeous classical music and then kind of insane uh early like electronic sounding music for the new york city scenes and it's a lot of sped up like oh it's time lapse. Of new york yeah. yeah a lot of time lapse and so like yeah if you watch people in grand central and like time lapse it just looks like ants right because they're all like rushing and through the different oh, exits yeah. and everything else uh so it's yeah the footage is really striking there's no dialogue there's no like words whatsoever it just is music and images but i'll play one of the crazier parts so this shot with like New York City rush hour and people in time lapse and people just running around. Oh wow. It's kind of like sampling the choir. Sampling the choir? What? Well the choir is looped, right? Yeah. Maybe not. Really. Where's like the creeper the creeper one? I'll skip ahead a little bit. Okay, but where's the scary one? When's the scary one? Do the scary one that Medea uses. There's like people running around. Yeah, do the scary one. <laughs> I want the scary uh, one. This is like, yeah, shout out Medea has a, she has oh, a piece. The, yeah. The Koyama Scotsi song itself. The, yeah. You want, the, you want the title track. Yeah. Um, oh yeah, Olfar Olfar Arnold's I think um, is a also. A, I I did a piece to his song. Oh, I did a black swan white swan piece. Oh yeah yeah. So he's a sort of electronic, but also I guess classical. So almost like experimental electronic yeah. music. Um, yeah, he's got some great stuff. This is the. One of the opening like songs, this very like dark orchestral thing, or this is like, more like choir, I guess. Oh yeah, and then there's With that some, like harpsichord going or organ. Yeah. There's also that one, that horror movie one, the Carmina Burana. Who did that? Brings in his, brings in his organ. It's creepy. Yeah. So Philip Glass uses a ton of repetition in his stuff. Is so he it, lazy? It sounds a little more like what you're used to in, ele in like electronic music or like pop music even. Oh yeah. So he just kind of brings in new layers of stuff. So. Do you, yeah. What about you? Know the O4 tuna, right? The mm -hmm. or and Carmina Burana. Those are like yeah. There's like classical ones that are used that people recognize. Who I guess. Comp who composed that? I don't know. I just know the songs because our neighbors used to play it uh, for Halloween. Oh, Carl Orff. Yeah. Our neighbors in our in an apartment in New York, like our oh. upstairs neighbors, they would like dress like witches and they would just like play the song and the, the door would be open. They'd be like, come in. Yeah. Come in, child. So have you ever thought, yeah, if you thought that like Carmina Burana was like, oh, that must be you know, a classical, like, opera piece or whatever. No, it's not. Composed in 1935. Yeah. So, like... Same time as The Wizard of Oz. After. Wizard of Oz was 20s. Where is... Where's my Spotify? Here, we'll play it real quick. Okay. For those who aren't familiar with Carmina Burana. And then it gets all like. Isn't this in like The Exorcist or something? The Omen? One of those. It's in, it's in like a horror movie too. Yeah, I know yeah, it's in a ton. There's a, it's using a ton of films. 
Yeah, great piece. And then they also are... play this when they're about to eliminate a drag queen on. <laughs> <laughs> they, yeah. And then I suppose we'll have to get into. It. I mean, maybe we'll do a whole no, whole no, other episode they, about. This is uh, great. This film, is great. Film music composers. I'm saying yeah. because we could go for hours more talking about like the Terminator like theme song and like the cool stuff about that and all the. I'm just thinking of all the like. Epic symphonic composers, for example. Listen um, to Dracula. Chef yeah, Maki, what's up? There's a composer up? who goes by Junkie XL who's composed a bunch of like the music for 300 and like Gladiator and any like modern like epic thing that you've heard. Uh, this guy has composed a name Junkie XL or whatever, but I forget his actual name. But uh, yeah, cool. there's there's a. Not too many. There's maybe a dozen composers out there who are doing a ton of, like, almost all of the, like, uh, if you need, like, an orchestral piece that's epic, like, you go to one of these guys. <laughs> God, I know a guy. pop song, you go to Max Martin or, you know, Dr. Luke or one of the other dudes. <laughs> Do you want to play something on your guitar for a bass for us? Hmm? Do you want to play? Do you just want to play, like, just, like, play us out with your... Musical oh, I'll play you a little. No, I'll just play you a classical electronic song that I composed with the loops. And... Oh, okay. But should we do our plugs first? Yes. Okay. Go ahead and plug while I find plug. this track. I'll plug away. So this weekend, this Friday, we have a party. We have a busy weekend. Yeah. Well, we got comedy, and then we have a party, and then on Saturday, we have the disco ball, which is your birthday party, right? Saturday night is my birthday party, the Disco Ball. Tickets are going fast. They are. They're going so fast. We've already sold. They're going. They're 60, going 60 like sixty of them. We can't fit that many people in here. Chopin. So pick them up. Show the end of Chopin's piece. I don't know. Very fast. Um, so yeah, come through at secret at Secret Loft. The address is not secret. Okay, so it's fourteenth. It's fourteenth one thirty seven West fourteenth. There you go. Yeah, that was confusing. <laughs> that was confusing way possible. Like it's 14, I was going to be like, it's 14th and 7th, but that's like not, yeah. I say that too. Um, so come through if you are listening to this in the future. And shout out to the Brooklyn Bush and Chef Maki with us again this week yeah. on Twitch. Um, the Brooklyn Bush has, has music online under the name South Second. And I think he's got a lot of unfinished stuff that's going to be released hopefully soon hopefully not posthumously <laughs> yeah hopefully and then uh i'll play you a oh, classical song right duh. give us a five star review please yeah we're gonna say at the beginning of the podcast well if you made it this far you save at the end <laughs> leave, leave us a five star there's review. one podcast that like the lady tells a secret at the end should we tell should we do that to make people listen it's a gimmick and people will just skip to the end now won't they True. What's, Maybe we'll tell a sure. secret in the middle. So go for it. I don't have any. It's like it's like putting ones. the ad reads in the middle, so people won't catch you. Yeah. Yeah. You'll um, never know. No, we always play an original song at the end. So here's one that oh, okay. is like sort of uh, this is classical and sort of uh, I guess like inspired by Tchaikovsky. Yes. And like uh, I love this one. Black Swan. I don't know, it's loading. I'm not sure what's going on here. <laughs> it's, yeah, we gotta get the, the band back together. But yeah, uh, I did already. Is, did you have your volume down? <laughs> no, it played the previous song. It's like, never again. Maestro? There we oh, go. Oh, yes, please. It's so pretty. It's so emotive. Thank you, Chef Maki, for a, a, a happy pre-birthday. So yeah, it's in two days. So as Ariel said, we'll see you uh, hopefully Friday night or Saturday. Or both? Saturday's going to be great. I'm going to be DJing the beginning of it and playing a bunch of really great tunes. And if we haven't proven our supreme mastery of all musical knowledge through this podcast, that was well, I guess you're the right one. Yeah, and if I sounded stupid about music, I am not stupid about but aerial dance. So I'll be doing it both those parties. You should do that as a future episode. This, I just wanted to do a circus one. Maybe next week. We'll also be Maybe back next week. week. We'll be back with the circus. Let's talk about P.T. Barno. Here's some Billy Wilson. Here. Yeah, you do.
show your profile. Now show me your black swan. My orchestral arrangement there, my strings, and timpani. Hey, you're playing your... Lily on the piano. Yeah, Lily's amazing. Go check her out, too. Yeah, you can actually hear and download this song at soundcloud.com, Wires of NYC. Yeah. Thanks for listening. Have a great time.